afternoon. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Alex Simmons, and that's, that's that big picture of me up there. Uh, and I do write a lot of comics. I've written quite a few. Uh, Batman, Superman, um, Archie, Scooby-Doo, and uh, a few original pieces of my own. And the, the whole thing about it is, and actually I have to get used to the fact that I have somebody else's computer, but... Yeah, isn't that, isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? So I'm best known for a series that I created called Blackjack, which is about an African-American soldier of fortune in the 1930s. So if anybody has seen in the Indiana Jones movies, it's that era, but it's an African-American man at that time and the different experiences he had traveling the globe. And I you know, take a little bit from real life and a little bit from my imagination, and I have a good time. And we'll talk. I've also done a series called Race Against Time, which is about a, a young boy whose name is Steven, and his uncle, his mother's brother, and every time the parents go out of town, the uncle who lives with them had a mysterious life before he came to live with them. Some adventure comes up somewhere in the world, and Steven and his uncle have to travel there and beat the bad guys and save everybody and get back home before the parents find out. So there's a lot of figuring out how to travel from place to place and you know how to time it and what you know, what type of conveyance to use. It's a lot of fun. The other one for the Batman series, I created a character called Orpheus. And Orpheus is a superhero, he's a crime fighter, who actually doesn't have physical superpowers, but his electronic or technology is based on sound. So he's able to do a lot of things using sound and the different types of gadgets that he's created. And that was a lot of fun for me to, to work on. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we talk about how writers, comic book writers and artists, use science fact to create science fiction. Uh, this is me and Archie, and I've done things with Chuck Clayton, and you'll notice over there is a little bit uh, space outfit, stuff like that, because outer space is a part of the things that fascinate me. I like space. Do you like space? Yeah? There you go. Um, the first man on the moon, I was a kid when that happened. You know, that was pretty exciting. Let me tell you this, just before we get started, I want to give you a little idea of how our industry works. Now, I'm a writer, okay? So that means basically, when I work on a comic book, my job is to come up with the story and to write the script. So you have like basically five major jobs and one big boss in creating a comic book. You have the writer who writes the script, that's me. And then you have a penciler. The penciler's job is to draw the whole story in pencil only. Pencil doesn't do anything else but that, and that's a big job. 22 pages, the, the boards that you draw on are about 11 by 17 in size, so they're very large. You've got to be really good at it. So once the penciler finishes, and everybody loves it, it goes to the inker, and the inker's job is to take ink in a pen or a brush and go over everything that the penciler drew. And then after that, there's a letterer. The letterer puts all the words on the pages that you actually read little speech balloons and things. That's the letterer's job, is to put all that on the pages. And the colors, what does the colorist do? Got what does the colorist do? They color it in. Bing. That's exactly what the colorist does. Yeah. So after everything has been written, penciled, inked, lettered, it winds up with the colorist, and the colorist puts the color on. Now, you see that name down at the bottom? Can you read that? What's it say? That's right, it says editor. She got, she got to it first. <laughs> the editor's job is to check everybody's work for quality, clarity, means it makes sense, it's clear, any mistakes, and to make sure everybody turns their work in on time. Just like when you're in school or at work, you know, you have to turn in your work on time and the teacher goes over your work to make sure, yeah, and he knows what I'm talking about. So it's just like that in business. So when we do comic books, there's a lot of people working on it. Sometimes one person does two jobs. But in the business world, more often than not, it's at least four or five people working on a comic book. Now these are some words that we use in the business. And I'm telling you this now because when I talk to you about how we do science fact in the science fiction, I might use some of these words, so I want you to know what I'm talking about. Panels. Panels are the boxes that we draw the pictures inside of. So a lot of times when you're reading a comic book, you're reading Spider-Man, you're reading a, an anthology or whatever, or Batman. And is that the super person I saw coming in? Ah, yes, okay. Yeah, I don't I can't see that guy, but that's okay. The drawings are inside the boxes or shapes, and those are called panels. <laughs> if there's a little narration, like meanwhile at the Batcave, 
Well, once upon a time on the planet Krypton, they're in small little boxes inside the panels. Those are caption boxes. We refer to the robots, the humans, the aliens, the ghosts, or whatever the story's about, the superheroes, as characters. All right, so when I say somebody, draw your own original character, I'm not telling you draw a boy or a girl. I'm saying draw a character. You can make it anything you want. How many people here saw, oh, let's see, Beauty and the Beast, the animated movie? Okay, what was one of the characters in Beauty and the Beast? Belle. Belle, which was a what? Yeah. Uh, and what? And the character was a? A woman. There you go. Okay. So, uh, name a movie that you've seen that was an animated movie. Well, I, I know that I've, oh, I've seen Bad Guys for Three. Madagascar. Okay, name one of the characters in Madagascar. Skipper. Skipper. What was Skipper? There you go. So, you, you know, Skipper is a character. The character is a penguin named Skipper. Right. So that's how the mind works. So if you're doing science fiction, aliens, robots, androids, all of those things are characters. As long as they talk and they have life, they're characters. Speech balloons. When a character is speaking, the little shape with the line pointing down to the character, that's a speech balloon. When a character is thinking, what is it called? A thought. Thought bubble because it's having a thought. And sometimes that looks like one big bubble with words and then smaller ones, or a big smoke cloud above and then little puffs of smoke leading down to the character. Those are thought bubbles. So panels, caption boxes, characters, speech balloons, thought bubbles, these are all words that we use in our business. I will be using some of them as I talk to you. I don't expect you to remember all of them. And anything I say that you don't understand, I'll be happy to explain. So let's move on. Okay, a brief history of science fiction in comics and media, starting back in the 1930s and 50s. I was born in the 1950s, so that gives you some idea. That's Flash Gordon from a movie in the 19, late 1930s. And you see that big thing he's holding that looks sort of like somebody took some tubes and cardboard and put them together? When they made that movie, to the people in the audience, that looked like a really cool ray gun. You know, it, 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 sparks came out of it, and we don't know how it worked, and nobody asked. It was a really cool ray gun, and you accepted that. Because it was very simple to do stories back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Somebody flew into space on a rocket ship. You accepted that. You know, a lot of the words they used at that time when they went to explain how this worked is they'd say rays. Oh, it's a special ray gun. Or it uses special waves, and that's how it makes things grow. Or it says the magnetic or electro or radioactivity. Radioactivity is a big one. As a matter of fact, how did Spider-Man get his powers? He got it from a radioactive spider. Bed. Right. In the 1960s, is when Spider-Man was created. He was bitten by a radioactive spider. Right. How, how did the Fantastic Four get their powers? Anybody? Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays. He's been studying. Okay. <laughs> Was it, a, was it a cartoon or live people? Um, cartoon. Cartoon, okay. So four people go into space, cosmic rays pass through their body, and they get these special powers. Yeah. You know what cosmic rays are? Yeah, I've seen... Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I know what cosmic rays are. Okay. It, it, it's special energy in space. Excellent, so excellent. I couldn't have done it better. Yeah, so the surgery is a good thing Okay, so... That's science fact and science fiction. Science fact is cosmic rays really do exist. Right. Special energy in space. Science fiction, if billions of particles of, of radioactivity pass through your body, it's really unlikely that you'll be able to flame on and fly. Yeah. It's really not likely that you're going to be able to stretch halfway across the room and get yourself a ham sandwich. Yeah. You know, that's fiction. So we take science fact and a little bit of fiction. So Blue Beetle had a technology that he used to fight crime, Flash Gordon comics, he had ray guns, ray guns, special wave, all of that. We move on. This was the um, Justice Society or the All-Star Squadron back in the 30s and 40s and some of them had special gadgets and ray guns and some of them had special arrows or special strength and power. Um, you'll notice there's a guy up there at the top who you can't make him out too well. But he has a rocket pack on his back. 
never had to really explain how they worked in those days. Everybody just accepted. This is King of the Rocket Man. This was one of my favorite old movies. The man put a helmet on. He had rockets on his back that supposedly worked from radioactivity. He had a dial on his chest, up, down, fast, slow, and then some sort of turn-off switch that we couldn't read. And all he had to do was run, turn the dial, run, <laughs> came out the butt, which was really kind of painful, and he flew into the air, right? He's flying and rocket sparks are coming out, and he was just fine. Never understood that. But you didn't have to explain it in those days. He just said it was cool. And, and sometimes we still do that. We say things are really cool. We don't want to know how they work. All of these characters here, I'm going to walk all the way back here. Most of these characters are like Robin, Batman, um, the Sandman, which is this one right here, and the blonde haired guy in the suit. They don't have superpowers. They're ordinary people who do remarkable things. But Starman over there, um, Spectre, Hawk, Hawkman, they had special powers. And we didn't, again, know how they worked then. It was just they were cool and exciting, and we liked reading stories about them. But then things changed in the 1960s. And one of the reasons they changed is because in the 1960s, scientists really started inventing cool stuff that the world was learning about. They were doing it before. But now it was becoming more well known. We had TV was showing a lot more to us. Newspapers were reporting a lot more. The man on the left was working on the, one of the first lasers. Now, Flash Gordon, before that, he had a ray gun. We didn't know how it worked. It just was cool. But now there's such a thing as a laser, a laser beam. Right. So it becomes more of a real thing. Yes, you have your hand up. Go for it. Yeah. It, it came out last year, fall. Uh huh. I, I like his accuracy. Yeah. A new version of it is coming out this year, but. You gonna share the name? It's called Skylanders, and the and the second that. season is the same name, but they he had giants. And how does that connect to lasers? What made you think about that when I was talking lasers? Why? Why? Okay, good. Okay. So Dragon Eyes is gold from the last year's giant trees that we raised in the end of Okay, well, you know, I, I don't mind some of the, some of the exchange. It's, it's good. I'm enjoying it. It's, it's not a problem. So, that's great. So, yeah, so this gentleman and scientists like him were inventing a, a, a real ray gun called a laser. And it can do so many things. That, that funny little thing that looks like a ball with, with, with uh, strong, like little strings or sticks coming out of it, that was one of the first satellites that went up and circled the globe. It was called a Sputnik, which was Russian. I still to this day don't know what it means. I know what it does, but I don't know why they named it Sputnik. But there, that was the name. And you know, in the 1960s, me hearing Sputnik, I kept envisioning something funny. So I would always laugh when I heard it. But that was actually man in space, putting a device up in space. Next to it, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say a man in space. That was man sending something into space. That's Apollo 13. That's one of the first man flights. No monkeys, no dogs, no animals, but humans going up into space. And then, of course, I throw a little TV action in there, the $6 million man. Why did I mention him? Because we were talking in the 60s about bionics, about being able to take mechanical parts and adding them to a human being and helping that human being function more quote-unquote normally. You know, maybe they had an accident or they, they were born without certain parts that, that we all tend to have or many people have. And so here we have gadgets that if you attach them properly would make life supposedly easier or more quote-unquote normal. Right, like Kirk Connors from Spider-Man. One, one of his arms is robotic. There you go. Or Star Wars. Yeah. You know, when Luke Skywalker lost his hand, he got a robotic hand. Uh, bionic. So, we had these things happening in the 60s, which meant that the audiences were now asking questions. You couldn't just say ray gun or robot or it's a secret formula. They now wanted to know a little bit more. They wanted more information. And like I said, we had the TV series Star Trek and the traveling in space 
And those were exciting stories. A lot of kids that I was growing up with never thought about space travel until they started watching Star Trek. Or some of the comics that we read about space travel, like Tommy Tomorrow, which DC was putting out, or Time Master. Now, time travel was my, my best fascination. The idea about being able to move backwards or forwards in time. You know, I wanted to believe you could do it. And of course, it made no sense to me if I'm living in the present, okay, I could go back in the past because that's already happened, but how can I go into the future? Because theoretically, that hasn't happened. So it got me sort of confused, but I love the, the concept of moving through time. So once again, I was a kid going through this, there were other kids going through this and wondering, wanting to know more and more things. So DC and Marvel started creating all kinds of remarkable heroes. Fascinating, scientifically based heroes. Spider-Man, radioactive bite from a spider. Fantastic Four, cosmic rays through their body. Doc Bruce Banner, turning into the Hulk. Again, radiation. A lot of that comes from the fact... Right. A lot of that comes from the fact that we created the atom bomb in the 1940s and now radioactivity on a grand scale was a part of our lives. Yeah, Iron Man, Ant-Man. Well, now Iron Man and Ant-Man built technology that gave them their abilities and some of these characters did that, but some of these characters are also aliens because we're traveling in space so we're thinking more and more about aliens and other life forms. Yeah, like the green Martian guy. Yeah, Man Martian Manhunter. Oh, uh, yeah. Either that or the Jolly Green Giant. Yeah. Okay. So we start thinking about, as a professional writer, whether I'm doing comic books, graphic novels, or children's books, or plays about science fiction characters, I always have to break it down. And writers have to break it down. What are we doing? What are we talking about? What's the area we're going into? Storm is considered a mutant. Right. All right? Which means that it wasn't radioactivity that suddenly went through her body and gave her her powers. She was born with them. Right. Her body is changing. Normal human beings are changing, are, are morphing, or mutating into another form. And so she, for some odd reason, has the ability to control the weather. So that's an interesting concept. How does she do that? Something to figure out. Yeah. The Hulk we talked about, the Flash, supposedly a scientific accident. Lightning struck chemicals in his laboratory, splashed on him, the lightning went through him, and supposedly they charged his body, the particles in his body, so he could now move super fast. That's what they told us in the 60s. If you read the comics now, they've got a whole nother storyline. Because they're tying into what they call a speed force. So they're looking at energy differently. Again, people are getting more scientifically minded, they're getting more excited, they're looking for more ways to tell the story. Superboy. When I read Superboy, he was Superman as a boy. This Superboy is a clone, which means they took DNA from the real Superman and in a laboratory grew this person who has some of Superman's abilities and some of his, his the way he looks, you know, the way he sounds. He's almost like they made another Superman. Cloning became something we started investigating in the 60s and 70s. This is Ms. Marvel, and her powers are cosmic, space, and energy. So as a writer, you have to look at the kinds of things that you're interested in. Technology, Iron Man, steel, uh, Mr. Terrific. You see those little balls floating there in the smoke? Those are actually little gadgets that defy gravity, and they have cameras in them, they have sound systems, sonic systems they can see through, through uh, sonic waves, see through walls. You can communicate them through uh, communicate with them through cybernetics, which means his mind connects to those, those, that technology, those little spheres. Iron Man suit. How does Iron Man suit work? Iron Man, Iron Man uses a very high level te technology. That's true. Right, using the power from his heartbeat when he, when he had that plane accident. Well, let's break this down now. So I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I'm going to ask everybody else a question. He has, you just said he has this heart thing. So he has a power source that's in his chest that's keeping a, a metal strip from the, plane, from the accident right. from going through his heart, right? Right, from keeping him from, from dying. dying. Right, the same thing that happened to his father. Okay, so now let me, you're, you're talking about from the movie. See, so his reference is from the movie. No, that's from the uh, Art of an Adventures cartoon. No, it's also, yeah, but it's also, it's, there's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Iron, right, uh, the 
Iron Man Adventures, so something of the suit, something like that. Yes, yeah, it's a French-made animated piece, right? Yeah, it's a bit that. different in the movie. Okay, so now let, let me just ask some other people questions. How does Iron Man fly? I don't, I don't remember. Take a guess. Well, he's got he's got a crest on something. It comes out of, from his feet, right? It's the old, old feet. Comes out of his feet. Okay, so that that sounds painful. But okay. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Okay, so what would we call that? Propulsion unit. Propulsion unit. What else would we call it? What else could he have in his feet or in his costume? Anti gravity. They used to be rocket jets, but I think now they're using the repulsor technology. That All right, uses because weapons. we're we're constantly evolving. It started out as rocket boosters, and then it went into propulsion units. If you look at the movie, he is steering through propulsion units uh, from his hands. Okay, how does he? He's in the suit. Okay, he's in the suit. How's he breathing, Mom? Come on, he's in the suit. How do you think he breathes? I don't know. He's cycling his own oxygen. Okay, that's a possibility. That's a possibility, yes. I think what happens is because that originally that the, the helmet was on, I, I originally think that air seeped in and inside the suit why Tony Stark was creating it. And I mean, before he slides on his mask. Well, okay, that, that works. Let me stop you there. Oh, your, your theory is good. Except that once you breathe in the oxygen and you breathe out, you're breathing out nitrogen. So after a while, that little bit of air that would have gotten in the helmet is gone. Right. So add what you thought to what... Is this your mom, by the way? Yeah. Good. I got that right. <laughs> add what you said to what mom said. So recycling the air. He has something in the suit that recycles the air. Because if it was the air coming from the outside, when he flies super fast, he'd suffocate. He couldn't suck it in fast enough. All right, let's try another one. Um, he's in the suit. And he dives into a river of molten lava. Why doesn't he burn up? That, you're working overtime. Let's get somebody else. Why doesn't he burn up? Um, extremely strong, uh, superior technology, uh, plastic or whatever, metal amalgam. Okay, so you're saying that the, whatever the suit's made out of? Yeah. Okay, that's one. Yes? Are you working towards a force field of some sort? Could be a force field. Is that possibility? What would you say? Um, well, the armor would probably be uh, able to survive high temperatures, plus he'd have a cooling unit, so he himself... Okay, so he just tapped, tapped on the other one. Because what happens if you take a can of beans and you put it on the stove and you turn off the fire? It, it depends. If you, you turn off... No, turn on the fire underneath that can of beans that's sitting on the stove. What would happen to it? Right, because the can heats up, so then the beans inside would cook and burn. Right. So without what this gentleman added, which is what, what did you say? He has, he'd have a cooling unit inside there like an air conditioner. So he has a cooling unit inside the suit, so he can go into extremely hot temperatures, or the opposite, into the deep sea, where it's really cold the further you go, the further, the further down you go. He has a heating unit. So this suit is pretty remarkable. And the more you think about it, the more stories that you have to write about it, the more you have to think, how does this work? That's why they started giving him all these specialty suits for special situations. Exactly. Science fact to science fiction. You're always going to come from some truth that you can then play with. Okay, so let's talk truths for a moment. How do we begin? I have represented here on the board three things. Let's go from actually from my right to left. Up there is the uh, Apollo 13 schematics. As a writer, if I was dealing with a rocket ship or a spaceship, I would have to look at schematics to see how basically they're built so that I could use some of that design ideas for my story. The swirly thing in the middle, the swirly colorful thing in the middle, what is that? DNA. Absolutely. This kid, he's going to be taking care of you. I'm telling you, you have to worry about a thing. He's on top of it. All right. So that DNA mo molecules. And a lot of the characters in comic books in particular, something's weird with their DNA. Either an accident changes it, or something in, in the mutating of the human genes changes it. But yes, definitely DNA is a big factor now. Anybody know what this is? This is a shot of nanites. Nanotechnology, which, which, yes, nanobots, which for all intents and purposes mean teeny tiny robots, microscopic sized robots that they want to put into whatever, the environment, the human body, into other machines. 
with programmed information so that these little robots can fix things and affect things. Bizarre concept, but wow, you know? And for those of us who are old enough, uh, what was it, the Fantastic Voyage? Shrinking people and a ship down to tiny size and injecting it into a human being so it could travel through their blood. And here we are now with technology that moves in that direction. We're not shrinking people down, but we've got microscopic technology. Phenomenal stuff. But as a writer, it's all exciting. Yes, sir? I, I, I've been thinking, I've, I've been thinking that it could be possible to have the fusion allow us to put a, a remote from the nanobots. Yeah. Well, that is, again, as a scientist, if that was the field you wanted to explore, that is exactly what you would do. You come up with an idea. What if we could, and you move that way. As a writer, we do the same thing, we just don't get the cool laboratories. So here, in this case, I'm creating characters that have uh, alien origin and a character, the female, that comes from the very bottom of the sea. And in thinking about her, Urchin is a name that we came up with, in thinking about her, one of the questions I, I put through my mind was, where at the bottom of the sea did she come from? We had lots of comic book stories, hang on a second, we had lots of comic book stories from DC and from other companies, sea devils, they were constantly running into you know, giant squids and whales and creatures and things. Where's at the bottom of the sea, the most unlucky submarine on the planet. It didn't matter where they traveled under the water, they got attacked. <laughs> you know, but you know, it was a cool show to watch, but just not a ship I wanted to be on. <laughs> and then Aquaman, which is DC's version of the Submariner. So you have the Submariner with DC, who's the ruler of Atlantis, and you have Aquaman, who's the ruler of Atlantis, which means Atlantis has got two presidents. <laughs> the other thing is when they come up out of the water from Atlantis, most of the time they seem to be near New York City. I don't know, geographically, I thought Atlantis was somewhere near Greece. So, you know, you know, as a writer, you have to do your homework, but sometimes you take the fact and you play with it. You move it conveniently. But either way, thinking about the sea, I wanted to know what are some of the dangers of the sea, the, the normal ones. Okay, so we have tsunamis, huge bodies of water coming in and destroying massive areas of land. And a tsunami is created by the same thing I know you want to get your hand in there, but I, I've got to cover a certain amount of territory before people start running out the door. Tsunamis have something in common with hurricanes. And they have something in common with earthquakes. Do you have any idea what that is? Of course you do. <laughs> Actually. Yeah, one or the other. When they collide or they rub, rub against each other in the wrong way, the land above quakes apart and moves apart. They like rumble and And when that happens, I hear what you're saying. When that happens under the ocean, it causes the, the, the water, the massive body of water to move. And depending on the force of those plates moving, the force of the earthquake, that's directly, that energy translates directly into the force of water and how much body of water is moved. So you will have sometimes an earthquake where just a building tips over, and sometimes you'll have an earthquake where an entire street drops down two floors. And that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at one level of the street, but with that dark black area, the top part of it is where the street should be. This part dropped down, so you're almost looking into the subway tunnels there. So this is the kind of force you're dealing with. And again, as a writer, I would have to find out as much information as I could about how that force works and how I wanted to use it for me to use it in my stories. Um, we would then create either a hero or a villain to deal with that, or a hero or villain who could create that. Now, in, this, in the workshops that I normally do where people have pencil and paper, I would ask you to do that. I would say, okay, we've deconstructed characters to a certain degree. I would say, let's attempt to create your own hero or villain who can either generate, let's, let's use one disaster, can generate an earthquake. So if you were gonna create a villain who could generate an earthquake, 
what would you want that villain to be able to do? He or she is going to be able to generate an earthquake. What's something that they would have to do based on this young man's formula? Well, I well no, hang on. I'm going to let's see what he's going to add to what you were saying. Based on he was saying, earthquakes are caused when the plates so shift. So then the person's going to have to be able to control some part of the actual geography of the land, the, the different layers of, uh, I don't know, rock or sediment or whatever. Okay, so what would you do? What would you give your villain to be able to create an earthquake? Any ideas? And mom can help you. Okay, so mom, what would you do? Turn out of vibration where you can push it back the other way. Okay, so we have a villain who's going to create something that generates vibrations that's going to affect the plates. Okay, so now let's go to, we have a hero. Here we have this earthquake machine. Some technology is creating earthquakes. The hero is either going to have to stop it or at least survive it while he or she tries to save lives. What would that hero need? Just one thing that you could think of that that hero would need. Armor. Armor. Okay, so he would give his hero some armor, which would do what? The purpose of the armor. Protect. Is it? about as simple as yeah, okay, so the armor would protect, so that's a certain amount of protection. Uh, is your, your, your dad or grandfather? Grandfather. Grandfather. Dad, grandfather. What would you add to that? We've got armor to protect the hero. What else would you give the hero to deal with this earthquake? A device for not getting crowded. A device for somehow avoiding getting trapped by it? Right. All right, would this device... Uh, destroy debris and stuff that was falling on it, or would this device anticipate? Yeah, we anticipate. Okay, so some sort of device that helps read the force that's going on, the vibrations that are going on, and maybe even be able to track where the earthquake is going to strike. So that's sort of the process. That's sort of the process. As a writer, the more I think like that, the more details I have to pull in, the more information I have to pull in that will allow me to make my fictional story sound plausible. Because we don't always accept nonsense that we're told. Which sometimes we do, but we don't always. Um, so those are my closing remarks, but I'll let that go. Yes? You can read that if you want. My idea for a superhero or a villain would be to have similar kind of powers, like the Mm -hmm. called Avalanche. Right. I remember him. With very powerful concentration, you create a very hard earthquake. Well, again, now, again, for me, when, I, when I'm dealing with that sort of thing, I like to ask these questions of myself. All right. Oh, let's use Storm. Storm is going to be easier. Yeah. Storm can control lightning. She can bring that on. Now, how can a human being allow that much electricity to pass through their body. Is there anything in factual scenario that we could use for that fictional situation? Is there anything about the human body whatsoever that's factual, that deals with electrical current or electrical energy, that you could say, well, maybe this is how it works? Okay, so we're going to work with path, path of least resistance theory. What else? Insulation or some kind of lightning rod? Well, it goes through her body. Mm -hmm. So she you doesn't have, have something inside your body that's already receptive to electricity. So we must have some type of, I don't know. Something in, in, the, in the body you're saying? In, in the deep. What, what, um, what is, what are, what, what's thoughts? What are thoughts in our head? What, what, you know, when scientifically, when we look at the human brain thinking, the firing. What are we? The firing of what? Impulses. Excuse me. What? Electrical impulses. Electrical impulses. Okay. So some aspect. One second. Some aspect, and it's a tiny one, but some aspect of our body deals with electrical impulses or electric electricity in some form. 
if you could find enough factual information that allows you to build on that theory. Now again, a lot of times people will just say, it's cool. You can do it because it's cool. Right. But the more we become scientifically minded, the harder, this is not the 1930s, 40s, or 50s anymore. It's not just a ray gun. It, there's got to be something behind it. And that's why a lot of the comic books you're seeing are a little bit more complex, even the ones for kids. But I think what that means is, and what I like to use it to do when I work with young people, is use their appreciation or their engagement with comic book characters to stimulate their academic studies. What you're learning in school now, this, this young man is a gold mine right here. If you want to write comics or anything like that, you've already got so much information. What you're learning in school, you can apply to all your fantasies and all your imagined worlds and scenarios. Because you're starting from something real that you can build on. Whether it's you're just going to write about it or you're actually one day maybe build it, make it possible. The um, Star Trek show used to have this little communicator. And they would just flip it open and they'd be talking to you. 1963, that was pretty cool. You know, because cell phones in 1963 were about this big. You know, and they were heavy. And you had an antenna attached to it. And you had this little thing. Now I'm walking around with this. In Star Trek Next Generation, no, not Next Generation, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Dr. Bashir used to read all his patients' charts and information on a, what looked like a plastic board with a screen on it. And he could tap and pull up information. And what do we have now? iPads. My, my Ah, yes. Is a certain power that relates to a type of sea animal that's from the mandrake and it's called an electronic torpedo ray. There's something inside an electronic torpedo ray that allows them to send out electronic shots in the water. And is that like an electric eel too, right? Similar. Similar. Right. So again, he, he's, he's a prime example of what I'm talking about. Right. Prime example. My guess is that Storm has something in her like an electric torpedo ray that keeps her safe from being hurt by bringing electricity down. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you got that on film. No, you <laughs> I got in the whole thing. We'll hire That's, him out as a consultant. Yeah, well, you know, Marvel could use you. <laughs> You know, but that, that's the principle. And again, I've worked with a number of, of artists and writers over the years, some of whom inspire the heck out of me. Um, a great mind, a great imagination uh, in one human being, Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby, to me, was to comic books what Jules Verne was to uh, you know, prose, literature. A lot of what he conjured up came out of his mind in the 30s, at, again, at that time when Flash Gordon was running around with the cardboard too. But he envisioned these possibilities based on whatever was coming into his life and created all these worlds for, for, for that Marvel has built off of. Uh, Jules Verne was writing about space travel and submarines at a time when we were still doing sailing ships and there were no planes. So, so the imagination is a powerful, powerful tool and the more information you take in, the more information you have to pull from, it can take you anywhere. And especially, again, as a writer or an artist, your, your mind is your greatest tool, your greatest weapon. Absolutely. Everything else beyond that sort of fits in behind it. Now, I'm just going to do a little Q&A time here because I know you guys want to get back out there and buy things or, or watch them break boards with their bare hands. So are there any questions? You know, anything you want to know about the industry or anything more about what I've been saying or talking about? I think it's great that you can put out the format so you can understand how the comic is Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Because I, 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 I never knew that, you know, the guy that colored wasn't the same guy that drew. A lot of people, believe it or not, a lot of people think it's all one person. You know, and, and part, part of that is not thinking of it as a business. You know, my mother referred to my comic books as funny books. Yeah. You know, they were things that had no validity in real life whatsoever. Right. Right. Um, but there were people making a living off of those funny books. 
And so, you know, once I try and break it down, it's, it's so that you understand it is a business, and there is a process, and especially when I do a convention once a year called the Kids Comic Con in New York City, and kids can come and see all, you know, it's all age appropriate material. They can come and not only see the different types of books that are there, but meet the artists, take free uh, drawing workshops with them, ask questions, see seminars and all that. The idea is to fill them with that understanding. If you just want to enjoy it for the fun of it, fine. If you maybe one day want to do it, here's some information that might be useful to you. And the big underscoring message there, deep, deep, buried down, is if you don't learn to read and write, it's very hard to create a comic book. Yeah. If you really don't take in information about how life works, society, history, sciences, very, you're going to do a one-note comic book. You're going to always do the same story. The more you absorb in life, the more you have to reflect. Yes? I have a question. I know that you work with uh, young kids a lot in education and sort of context. Um, sometimes you see a lot of these comics being used by to help uh, young people learn how to read both not only the English language but also visually. Mm -hmm. But do you see maybe a trend also uh, since you're talking about science fiction and physics and math, uh, uh, those type of teachers uh, teach the sciences or mathematics, trying to use maybe comics to help get our, our students interested. There seems to be well, a push towards uh, math Here's what science. tends to happen organically. People think adults who aren't into comics think comics, oh, reading. So they only see it as a tool for underscoring literature, reading, that's it. The fact that in the art classes that I've taught, the comic art classes, after school or wherever, I've had entrepreneurial discussions. We've done comics based on great literature, like you know, even Animal, animal uh, Farm. I had a 13-year-old girl do an eight-page adaptation of Animal Farm. Well, fine, you want to do it. It's not just drawing the funny animals. It's what's the story about? What's the political message there? What are you trying, to, what's this, was the author trying to teach us? And in discussing that, you get both. You have to understand the material in order to be able to break it down into this new format. So there's that. I also do uh, history. Um, there was a teacher that I know was doing a unit on the uh, rise of the Nazi party in Germany. And he says, is there any way you can work comics into this? Because the, the, the young men I work with, it would help you know, keep them engaged. So I said, fine. We're going to do a time travel scenario. You're going to create a character who is there in Germany when this is happening. You can pick a particular day and incident or just during that time period. You know, people are being rousted out of their homes and all these things are happening. Your character is either born and raised there, travels there via normal methods during that time period, time travels or is an alien. And once that character is there, they are affected or they affect that incident. So once again, to build that, the character and the, and the story or plot line, you have to understand the material. You have to understand that environment. And so the students had to get into the, the, the material and they had to discuss it in order to then create a story that would go with it. So what I do is I create curriculums and I create lesson plans that allow me to introduce them to sciences, social studies, you know, humanities, uh, history, whatever. Because once again, it's about having, the way I present it, let's have a good time while we're, we're figuring out how this all connects. So that, that's, that's my response to that. And I think we need to encourage that more so that they don't just see this as, oh, this will help them read. You know, as I like to say, nobody builds a house with just a hammer. I see comics as just one more tool in the box to help reach reluctant readers or kids who are struggling because it's English as a second language or just kids who aren't engaged initially. And here's another way, another path to use. Any other questions? Do you have any questions? I see a good way to um, get people that are solely English speaking to speak other languages. Absolutely. Archie Comics does, um, there's two countries that their, their, their comics are translated into another language that's super popular. There are many countries, that do, but India, and uh, the Spanish-speaking countries. And so many times I've gone into schools with same issue, same comic book in English and the other language. 
and we get into that. And for me, you know, the, the assumption by kids who are Spanish speaking is that I'm only there to teach them English using this method. But I said, no, 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 no. I, I threw this word down. How do you say that in Spanish? To me, it's an exchange. You know, I'm respecting your language, and I'm going to learn with you. I'm going to learn something you're going to teach me, and you're going to do the same, I hope. You know, so that's, that's the way I try to put it together. Any other questions? Well, I'm here. I'm here for this, you know. Yes. <clears throat> um, I got into a DC universe through Super Friends, and apparently he got a lot of uh, his Iron Man knowledge from Armored Adventures. What do you th how do you think uh, comic companies should be utilizing their properties in shows and movies instead of just saying, let's make another excuse to make money to draw them into the comics? Yeah, I, there's, there's a big battle about that because you, you know, the comic book industry used to be run by comic book people or people who were at least based in publishing. You know, they came out of that era. Uh, now it's corporate run. Disney runs Marvel, Warner Brothers or Time Warner runs DC. And so ultimately what you have is a scenario of how are we making money? How are we getting movies done? How are we getting more audiences? How are we selling more merchandise? Hang on one second, I'll be right with you. Don't go away. Um, so I think part of what you're looking at is who's interested in accomplishing that, getting people more into comics, whether it's print or digital. Uh, let me just grab this question and then I'll, I'll come back to you. Yes? Mm -hmm. The best possible answer is the midnight zone. There are three zones of the ocean. The sun white zone, mm -hmm. where most, most every sea creature is. Twilight zone, where light ends. Mm -hmm. The midnight zone, the dark, deepest, darkest part of the ocean at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right. So whoever, whoever must be an aqua superhero or supervillain must come from the Okay, excellent. And what you would build off of that is, considering that's where they come from, what are their natural abilities? Now, you don't have to answer that. Don't answer that for me. I'm saying that would be the question that we would use to build on the characters, like the one I had up there. I had to do that very same thing. For instance, if it's that dark, they obviously have the ability to see in the darkness very well. How does that affect them when they come up through the other zones and into the land world where it's light. Do they only move around at nighttime? Is even that too bright? Those are the questions you start to ask yourself as you're creating these characters. Anyway, I'm going to uh, let everybody go because I see they're filtering out. You're welcome. Thank you for staying. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, Ms. Ann, but I had to solve a Wi-Fi problem for somebody. Understood. Actually, when we were doing